Welcome back to the OPEX podcast where fitness is explained. I am your host, Robbie Burke, and I'm joined on today's show by Derek Evely. Derek is one of the foremost experts on the Bonnerchuk training system. And on this episode, we discuss everything and anything to do with the Bonnerchuk training system. Towards the end of the show, I also asked Derek about the biggest lessons he has learned in his life and career. Derek gives us his top and current book recommendations. I asked Derek if he only had one year left to live, how would he spend that year? And finally, I asked Derek the big question. If he could invite five people to dinner, dead or alive, who would he invite and why? Guys, this was an absolutely outstanding episode with Derek. It is seriously jam-packed full of information. I know you're going to love it. Stay with us. Okay, Derek Evie, we are recording, sir. Thank you so much for making time to come and speak with me today. So, D, for the listeners and also some of the viewers who might be too familiar who you are, give us the full background. Me? My background? Oh, okay. I am a uh, stay-at-home dad right now uh, who is, uh, does, uh, I'm, I'm the owner of Evil, Evil Track um, Sports Consulting and uh where i i basically consult uh with uh mainly different athletic groups and sport groups international federations and things like that on all matters uh to do with uh, coach and sport development um i specialize mainly in high end training systems and uh in particular the bonnerchuk methodology but i also have a big background and lecture a lot on uh like developmental, um, like childhood developmental sport and programming mm. and things like that. So I've written a couple of uh, LTAD models, if you want to call it that, uh, for uh, for different countries. I wrote the one for athletics or helped to write the one for athletics for Canada. I had some input uh, into the one in Britain and uh, had my fingers in a few other pies in that regard as well. So uh, I was a decathlete as an athlete and um, was a head coach of a club here, brought Bonner Chuck over, um, studied under him uh, for a year when he lived in my basement. Then from there, I went to the Canadian Athletics Coaching Center, was the uh, sports science manager there. But really what I did there was create uh, all that online web content, which I think was mm-hmm. probably the first of its kind. This is going back like, Mid 2000s, yeah. 12, 14 years now, um, where we started doing these podcasts and things like that and interviews online and posting a lot of, uh, uh, you know, uh, theory and methodology and, and different types of information uh, online. And, and then from there, I, w- I went to Britain. I was a center director for one of the two Olympic training centers going into the 2012 Games for UK Athletics. And our friend Dan Paff was the other center director, the one in London. I was responsible for the center that looked after the entire UK outside of London. So, mm. And since then, I've moved back here, and I've been sort of doing a little bit of coaching here and there, uh, some, a lot of it remotely. I uh, had my own setup uh, on my farm, but I but I packed that in and moved into town in Kamloops, BC. I'm now, again, very close to Dr. B. I see him fairly regularly, and I'm developing a website right now that um, uh, where we are putting together an online course to teach Bonderchuk uh, the Bonner truck system from start to finish. No, nothing has even close to being, to being done like this before, other than, you know, what Martin has put together on his site. He has a ton of good information about Bonner truck, but this is an actual course starting someone and saying, okay, you want to do Bonner truck? This is everything you need to know. And this is, we walk you through it start to finish and give tons of examples of how the setup would be in various sports, various different sport disciplines and things like that. So that's where my head's at right now. So it's probably a good time to, uh, to do this because I've gone way, way back deep, deep into the Bonner truck stuff. And uh, it's been interesting because my use of the Bonner truck system over the last 10 years has been fairly specific to sprints and throws i've used a little bit in sprints but um but mainly in throws been pretty successful with it 
Um, but now going back and looking at it, uh, it's interesting to go back and revisit a lot of those methods and that, uh, the methods and the peculiarities of sport form and all of that and going mm. and talking to Dr. B and it's, it's been kind of fun. So. Is it as painful as the first time you tried to write a book together? Or that story and you were like, Dr. B is like, no, oh, it's always painful with no, him. It's no, always no. painful with him because he's, uh, he's, I mean, he's, he's, he's older now. So he's a little more laid back, but he's, uh, <laughs> um, th well, when, when, when we started to write that book and that book, parts of it are going to be included in this course. So people that take the course will get that book. Um, it's going to be up there. Um, and I've used a lot of that as the framework, but when him and I wrote that, he couldn't speak any English, mm -hmm. like almost, almost nothing. And so what he would do is, you know, he's living in my basement. I, I renovated an apartment down there, uh, here in Kamloops and, um, I, you know, I remember the first night, first night he was there. It was uh, April 1st, 2005, actually. And I remember that because it was April Fool's Day and we had our manure sale on that day. And I was out all day with the manure sale. I came in at 10 o'clock at night and he, door flies open. He's like, there, there, come, come. And he said, and he had written all these pages. He wanted to write this book and he'd written it all in Russian, handwritten, and then translated it word for word with a Russian English dictionary and handed it to me and said, okay, you write in, in, in computer. And I'm like, <laughs> it's like gobbledygook, right? <laughs> so, you know, so we started about a, it's about a four or five, yeah, four, maybe five month long process where we would for three hours a day in between the two training sessions, him and I would sit in my basement, I had a little desk set up and we would write this book, but it was so hard because he's very stubborn and you know he kind of came there thinking you know he's moving to this podunk Canadian town and who's this guy this coach I've never heard of you know uh, what is this this guy doesn't know shit so you know he thought I was you know basically you know and I was in a lot of ways very inexperienced but I had this, I've always had this passion and this interest in training theory and methodology. I don't know why it is. I just, just always have. So I was very familiar with a lot before he got there and I'd read all of his stuff and I'd read, you know, I, I, I had a pretty good, my head was in a pretty good place there. So I would say, well, I think you mean this. And he would be, no, 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 no. And we'd argue for 30 minutes, 40 minutes. And then he would, in the end, it would take me that long to convince him that, of what I was saying, then he go, oh yeah, okay, good, and and then <laughs> it, was, it just it was just you know, anyways, it it was a tough it was a tough thing, and then we uh, so we wrote six chapters, and uh, they never saw the light of day, but I that in you know I'm babbling on about this, but it actually is pretty interesting because what happened was that after that it's when he started writing all of his books in English. Okay. So that's when he started doing um, the, you know, the transfer training books and in particular the, you know, the green and maroon and blue, these ones here, these ones, right. The, the period periodization and training and sport books. Yeah. They cost like were, 70, cost like $80 a pop they do. Yeah, and they're and they're very difficult to read for a bunch of different reasons, not the least of which is the translation. And and I tried to discourage him from that. I said, no, don't don't do that. And so he, but he's too impatient, right? He 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 wouldn't do it. So he he went off and uh, he took. I I wrote for the first one. This is number that was number four. I showed you, but number one, um, I think I have it right here. Hang on, this one. So this one, the first one. All of these charts in here, I, I wrote those for the, for the, uh, and he took those and, which is fine. I mean, it doesn't bother me. He, but he had taken those and basically repeated that in with this translator and they're very difficult to read. So the point of the story is that I let our book sit for years, years mm -hmm. and years. And then I, I sent a copy of it to Martin Bingisser once and, and, and hadn't looked at it in like a decade, ten, eight, yeah. eight to 10 years. I looked at it. I was like, wow. I was like, this is actually pretty good. You, you can actually understand it because 
as painful as it was to write, you know, it, I wrote the English, so at least it's semi-readable, right? I mean, not that all my writing is readable, but, you know, and uh, it's not quite, it's a little thin in the text relative to what he does, but you, you get the ideas. I think yeah. it comes across just as well, if not better. And so I'm taking a lot of that and, uh, and I'm, I'm using it with the course. So I think people find that kind of interesting. All right, it's great. Yeah, I love that story about Bonner Shook about the you were out fucking shoveling shite all day and he just came home and there he was and he's like, We write book now. Yeah, yeah. I was literally covered in shit. I was literally I'd been hauling sixty pound bags of manure, um uh horse and uh mainly horse and steer manure all day. And I I mean I had coveralls on, I was just and he didn't even let me change. We we worked until about one in the morning. Yeah. <laughs> it was crazy. All right, so uh, you recently come out with this course, which is fantastic because you said your headspace is now really deep into the Bonnerchuk system and methodology. So the first uh, question I have for you is maybe describe the exercise classifications from the Bonnerchuk method. Okay, well, pretty straightforward. And, and I talk a lot about this. You know, it's, it's interesting because the module on exercise classifications in the course turned out to be a bit longer than I thought because, um, you know, it's pretty straightforward. I've taught this part of it a million times. I thought, okay, it'll be straightforward. But then when I started describing them and talking about them in terms of other sports, and in particular the CE and the SD, but particular the C CE and how that's going to break down and look how you're going to classify a sport like soccer, right? Mm -hmm. In terms of the CE, uh, it actually was quite an involved conversation. So that's about an hour. That's a, I think there's four or five videos on the course that we have on exercise classifications going through the basics and the examples, but essentially it's, and, and again, um, I, I say in the course, you know, this of all of Bondachuk's contributions, which have been great, and I know a lot of them are kind of hard to understand and he, you know, it's been tough with the translations and that of all of the contributions. I think that the exercise classification scheme he came up with is largely overlooked. I think it's a really big contribution that he's made because, you know, we've used it, you know, every organization I've worked with, when I sit down and explain it to them, they all want to use it as their, as their way to communicate amongst coaches and classify everything. Because as you know, Robbie, we have such a problem with terminology in sports science, you know, um, especially in theory methodology, like, and I say this in the course, like we, in athletics, we can't even agree on what speed means, Yeah. let alone, you know, you, and strength is crazy. It's so, it's so broken down and, you know, uh, you know, what, what strength endurance can mean one thing to one person or, uh, or a better example, speed strength can mean all kinds of different things to different people, right? So for the Bonnichuk classification, the way he breaks things down, just makes it really simple. And, it, and it's all based upon um, specificity in two, in, in two forms, okay? I don't know if form is the right word, but two types of specificity is it does it look like the the sport that you do the competitive event and does it stimulate the same systems and so there's four different classifications and so the first one the top one the most specific is called the competitive exercise okay it calls everything everything's an exercise okay um the competitive exercise is the event that you compete in okay so if you're uh if you're a uh, a long jumper, it's the long jump, okay? And you might be able to break that down a little bit in terms of, you know, short approach versus long approach long jumps, but it's the long jump, okay? Anything where you, yeah, anything where you're, where you're doing the full long jump, that's a CE, okay? If you're in, and this is where it gets a bit tricky, if you're in a, like a team sport like uh, football or something like that, so it's, let's, let's say soccer, okay, European football, um, then it's playing soccer, okay? And that's where the discussion gets a little bit tricky is how do you break that down when you're talking about planning, training that, but that's a whole other discussion. But then the next level down you have is specific development exercises, which also stimulate the same systems as the competitive exercise. So it's, you know, if it's a speed event, it's 
speed, if it involves explosive strength, that's what it is. But in form, it is taking the competitive event or exercise and breaking it down, okay? So really easy example to use is throwing. Um, if you're a discus thrower, a CE would be the full discus throw. If you're, if a, the SDE would be say a stand throw hmm. um, or some kind of drill with an actual throw in it. You've taken the actual competitive movement and you've isolated a part of it and you're working on that. Um, in traditional terminology, you might see this as specific strength, okay? Again, that's a, that term gets means different things to different people. Um, in athletics, in particular, throwing specific strength means doing the the throwing pattern, the throwing movement with overload. Okay, and that's another aspect of the SDE, the specific development exercise, and that that is this idea of overload. Okay, mm -hmm. so that's SDE. Then the next one is the is the specific preparation exercise and that is where you are uh you're not following the comp the exercises that you use in that classification do not follow the competitive exercise in terms of form so it doesn't look like it but it uses the same major muscle groups okay and but but it also stimulates the same system so the first three exercise classifications all deal with stimu you know all work within the the basic systematic physiology of the of the sport or event yeah the top two the ce and the sde they they replicate it in terms of form the bottom two don't replicate it in terms of form okay um and the sp that we're talking about is the third one down so that's the so that doesn't replicate in form but uses the same major muscle groups stimulates the system so those are essentially for the most part, they're weight room exercises and things like that. More global type, of, more global strength abilities, things like that. Mm. Then you get down to the bottom of it, the last one, which is GPE, which is completely general, doesn't look like the competitive event, doesn't stimulate the same systems, doesn't use like the major muscle groups. It's Things are a little bit more isolated. So it's basically all your, your most general exercises that don't really don't contribute directly to form okay they don't they don't transfer very well um if you find that general exercises are transferring in your programs it means your athlete is so out of shape that it's you know or at such a low level that yeah you know anything will transfer so that's essentially those are the four exercise classifications yeah and you know, since I learned about them a few years ago, I've, I utilize them too, and I, I do find them extremely helpful. And it's funny, you, you know, you, you mentioned about like soccer there and it gets a little more trickier because that's where my mind has been with them over the last couple of years or so is, you know, here in Ireland, like I would be more heavily involved with our Irish sports, so Gaelic games. And I was always kind of thinking in my head, like, okay, so the competitive exercise is the actual sport. And then it's like, peeling peeling the, the 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 layers back in the onion there it's like so then it's training is that like you know is our scrimmages or as the americans call it our training our practice sessions is that like the sd like is that where all the std stuff falls in there now and then all of our you know physical preparation work we're kind of getting down to you know the sp stuff and then and then the gp stuff as well so and then just even like within sessions it's kind of like like the, the certain drills or small sided games we use, it's like trying to classify those as, you know, is that like SP or is that SD? So it's, yeah. it, is, it is an interesting conversation when it gets to team sports. Yeah, and, and, and though in that example, when you're looking at team sports or, or sports where, and I use MMA as a, as a big example in the, in the course because I find mixed martial arts to be the most challenging of all sports to classify okay because when you think about it a mixed martial artist has to be fast powerful have strength endurance qualities aerobic endurance and qualities not only do they have to have across the board you know in terms of their 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 systematic response or the systematic requirements or the physiological requirements required in their event, they have to do it in all movement patterns as well. I mean, they, they have to be 
you know, you can't be weak in any movement plane, in any movement, because you don't know what position that you're going to end up in. And um, so I use that a lot as, as an example. So it's not just team sports, but it's more what I, you know, open loop type things. And I know open loop is probably not the, the, the right term for that, but you, you, you get what I mean. You know, yeah. things like, like shot put is very close closed loop right I mean it's it's like you throw and it technically it's not closed loop it's actually open loop but the way I describe it it's you know you do the shot put no one's trying to hit you no one's knocking you over you don't have to react to anything you just get in there you throw it and that makes it really simple to classify whereas in sport where you know there's there's all this variance in terms of movement and the physiological demand that's those are much harder to classify but you know thankfully it doesn't i mean you have lots of flexibility there mm -hmm. and when it comes down to it yes a lot of exercises will be in the gray zone but you know it doesn't really matter as long as you know where you're classifying it and as long as you're you're accounting for the loading then it doesn't really matter and in fact and this is an example i use in the course is that you know they can change like for it can change based upon your priority. So let's say in one development cycle, you are classifying, um, let's say in soccer, you are classifying one element of soccer. Okay. I don't pick one. I, I don't know whether it's uh, you're sprinting, let's say, and then you, that you're you're going to treat like a CE. So when you're training that, you're going to train that in 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 as competitive an environment as you can. Yeah. And then you may have another element of the CE which you which you train as an STE. You're breaking it down, and you're going to be training that element maybe off the field in a more controlled environment, say a weight room or wherever. Okay. And then you can flip those two around in the next development cycle. There's no no, there's no reason why you can't do that. Right. So, you know, it's, it's, yeah, there's classifications, but they're not, they're not black and white. It's not mm. so black and white and, you know, solid lines in between. Some things are gray and that's fine. As long as you understand where you put it and you account for it, you're loading, you'll be fine. Yeah, I think it's just the organization they bring to your top process when you are coming to the classifications of exercises. It, you know, it's, it's, it's a really nice model that Dr. B introduced. And just a question on that, like, have you ever asked Dr. B about applying the model to team sports? Has he ever said anything to you about it? It's a conversation I'm about to have with him. Um, I have to be careful when doing this about how much I ask him because he can send you down rabbit holes like crazy, right? Like he, you know... Um, but I am going to have that conversation with them and people that take the course will get, you know, there's going to be a forum where people can discuss online and he'll be a part of that periodically. Uh, some of his, uh, contracts he's done in back in Russia with some of his publishers don't allow him to actually have a presence on the site. Oh, for God's but sake. He's basically through me. I'm, I, you know, any questions I have, I, I ask them and, that will be a question, but I've pretty much set it up and, uh, uh, you know, I'm, I'm in the process of setting that part of it up right now. And so I'll have that conversation and get his input for sure. But I haven't really sat down and asked him about it. That's a long conversation with him, just with the communication and that. So I haven't done it yet. Before we move on, why did he move to Canada? Like, why did he even choose Canada? I, I know there was the whole, you were getting emails and you thought it was someone playing a prank and then he found out it was Dr. B. But like, what even, what even got into his head to, to go to Canada? His daughter was in Canada. His ah. daughter married an ex-NHL uh, Russian player, a guy named uh, Igor Shiverev. A good guy, really good guy. And I think he played for a bit for New Jersey Devils, I think. I'm not sure. But they ended up in Calgary. And they approached me uh, when I was the head coach of the, the Kamloops club. They actually sent a, a letter to the club president. She forwarded it on to me. And I, like you said, I thought it was a joke from a friend of mine. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, you know, when I realized who it was, uh, you know, we, I was really eager to, you know, if you wanted a job, we'd give it to her. At the time when he asked us, we said no, because we didn't have, we, we were just this podunk little club. But that manure sale was taking off. Yeah. The manure sale took off and we were making 50,000 bucks a year. 
And so I went back to the club executive and I said, look, well, you know, we, we need to make, we need to get this guy over here. We need to make this, this opportunity happen. They all fought it. N none of them wanted him there, including the, who the club president or the, uh, I think she was VP. It's Dylan Armstrong's mom. She didn't want it. Um, just thought that we couldn't afford it. Didn't think, you know, it was worth it. And then, um, but I pushed and pushed until I got, I got what I wanted and we brought him over and, you know, now they're, they're all of course, very thankful, uh, that, that he's around and, you know, worked out really well with Dylan and stuff. So that's great. Isn't it? All right. So moving on, I think, so we've spoken about the classification of exercises. I think the next good place to go to would be the most common methodology to use within the bonded truck system. So the complex method seems to be the most common people talk about, but I know you are also talking about stage and variation, and then there's like complex stage and complex variation, and then there's a whole boatload of other ones. So we open up his transfer training books that he did through Dr. Yes's. There's like all these different different uh, me methods, and it was funny because I remember I think we spoke about this when we, when we met in person at Altus last year, and I've also heard you say in our podcast that you went to Dr. B and you were like, you know, Doc, like you have all these methods, but I only ever see you use these. And he, was, and he said something like, yes, yes, but you could use this one in volleyball or could use this one in this situation. Yeah. And, and you're like, yeah. you've never said that. And he got, and you were like, he just assumes that people would understand yeah. that. Which is a problem with his, with, he's just, he's not, he just doesn't give examples, right? Like he, he just, it's not his style. It's not the way he writes. And, you know, it's one of the big reasons why I'm doing this course is to, yeah. is, you know, and we give a lot of examples in this course. I mean, at the end of the course, I'm going to have full on separate videos where I walk people how to set it up in individual sports. I think I'm going to start with baseball and sprints because those are the big questions I get a lot. Okay. And, but I'm going to put, you know, a number of them down there. Okay. So here's the thing with methods. Okay. Is, and it's, Good time to ask because I've just gone through all of them over again. Oh, wow. In the, in the course, I lay out, I go through 16 methods, the original 16 that he wrote in the first book. Mm. That's one section of the course is just talking about methods. Then the next session goes, which is peculiarities, is the, um, the methods again, but with the reactions overlaid on them, Okay. By the time you get to the second, the end of the second one, you have a very good understanding on how it all works. And you, and I did it in a way that you kind of trying to educate people to understand the, the, what the implications are for using one method over another and how the athletes react you know, and, and the timelines and things like that. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, and at the beginning of it, it takes a while to explain everything, but by the end, I'm just flipping, I'm just flying through these different examples because by then the, the student gets there and they go, Oh yeah, I know all that. I mean, you, you can figure it out just by the review that we had done before. So this is, this is how it works. So it all comes down to timelines. Okay. So certain methods will get an athlete into peak condition much faster than others. Yeah. Okay. The reason why, and this is if you buy into all the methodology and all the arguments that Bonner Chuck makes here. Okay. So I have to say that I do not everybody does. Okay. So a complex methodology just to be clear, that is where you start off. You're basically working on all exercise classifications and from the start to the finish. And this is what makes, this is what makes bonder checks complex a little different than the common idea or the common um, definition of complex that out, that's out there in bonder checks methodology from the start of a cycle to the end, when an athlete reaches peak condition, there is no change. There's no change. You, you do the, you don't change the exercises. You start with a, with a group, a training program, a group of exercises, whether it's one, two or three programs, and you go to the end. And then um, in between those two points, the start and when the athlete reaches peak condition, there's no change. Okay. If you do that, that is the fastest path to peak condition. All right as opposed to 
a stage methodology where you are going to take, in Bonnerchuk's example, it's you're taking the general, the two bottom general classifications, you're working on those until the athlete reaches peak condition in those, then you're carrying mm. the SPE over and introducing the, um, the SDE and CE, and then those reach peak condition afterwards. So in effect, you have two stages, a stage of general prep and a stage of specific prep, okay? So <clears throat> that, in, in, in its basic sense, is the same as if you're doing a stage complex, then you are doing it, um, that is the same as a complex, but all you've done is you've taken the two exercises and you've exercised classifications and you've moved them over and you're isolating those, reaching peak condition in those first, then you're doing the next two with one of them crossing over, okay? Mm -hmm. So all it means is that it's just going to take you longer to do it because you're doubling the amount of time rather than doing all of it at once. You're doing half of it, getting it over with. Then you're doing the more specific work. And then you're getting all that over with, reaching peak condition. And at the end, you would presumably compete. Okay? Mm -hmm. So the question is, why would you do that? Why would you do that when you can do them all together? Well, you know, certain people like that type of, you know, they were big believers in strength. They, they feel that in their sport. Or the, or the way they do it, they want to have that big base of strength there before they start specific work. So that's what you, that's what you do. And the only difference between that and block is that you don't carry over the SPE or the weight room work, the global strength abilities, you don't carry that over into the second, into the second stage of specific preparation. It's the only difference between stage and block. Okay. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So but it gets more complicated when you look at the difference between complex and variation, okay? So he has two methods when we just talked about complex. There's another method that looks just like complex. It's the exact same thing, except where you're doing all four exercise classifications at once. And the athlete reach, you do them all together, and the athlete reaches peak condition, and that's the end of the cycle. But it, and that's called the variation. But in the variation, you're changing the exercise sets every two to four weeks. Yeah. Okay. And according to Bonderchuk, when you do that, if you the more you change, the longer it takes the athlete to reach peak condition. Okay. If you're following me here. Yeah. So yeah. if you do it, if you change the exercises every four weeks, and this is just the example he gives, if you change it every four weeks it will take the athlete twice as long to reach peak condition as it would if you did it pure complex. Mm -hmm. If you change it every two weeks, it's going to take four times as long. Okay. So this to me, and I talk about this in the introduction of the course, it's like, even if you don't do bonder Chuck, going through that whole process to understand that is absolutely enlightening to me because what it says to me is that, in all of these more traditional programs where we have all this cyclic change all the time, if you buy into what Bondarchuk's saying here, it means that without even knowing it, we are causing these athletes to reach peak condition much later than they normally would if we just didn't change things as much. Mm. So the basic, I, the basic message is the more change you have, the more frequent you change things, the longer it's going to take to reach peak condition. That may be fine in your program. You may like that. But one of the big concepts, overall concepts in the Bonder Chuck method is to try to get more peaks in a given time, in a given season. And that works. Like I, the athletes that I've worked with will peak anywhere from five to seven times in a season, as opposed to very traditional methodology, which will have one or two peaks maybe three. Um, and, uh, you know, so ideally, the idea is with each new peak, there's a an overall rise in growth, the athlete gets better overall. So you get more growth in a shorter period of time. So these methods, you know, really, it's not about what's good or what's bad. It's what what is most appropriate for the sport, your philosophy on training, you can they all work, they're all legitimate. 
There's another one which rarely gets talked about, which is called the combination method. Mm. And the combination method um, is one where it's basically a stage, a stage methodology. Well, you can do stage combination or block combination. Let's say if you're doing a stage combination, it's just like a stage methodology as I described. But in that second stage of specific preparation, that is broken into two parts where there's a third part at the very end where you, it's the only one you do the CE in. It's called the um, stage of development of sport form. So in other words, in, in general prep stage, you're doing the GPE and SPE. Mm -hmm. then, you, then you reach peak condition. Then you, then you carry over the SPE into the stage of specific preparation, which the first part of it is SDE and the SPE that's been carried over. Okay, I hope you're following me here. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. Then, and then at the end, you don't introduce the CE until the very last stage. Okay? Um, and that's now you look at this and I go through all of this in, in the, in the course and you look at, you go, well, why the hell would I ever do that? Right? Like why, you know, so essentially, you know, you're going stage and it's actually called stage complex because in each of those stages you're doing complex. Okay. Well, you would do that in a sport. And again, in the course I go with each of these, I go through all these kinds of examples where it may be appropriate. Think of something like, <clears throat> well, and we have lots of them in Canada because we have a lot of winter sports where, where um, you can't get access to do your CE. You can't get access to facilities to do your CE except for very small windows during the year. Let's say you are a bobsledder, hmm. okay? And you can do all the bobsled training, the general training, and the more specific training, you can invent SDE, specific development exercises, that second class, very specific. But you, you got to do those. You can do all of those off the ice. You can do them in your hometown. Your coach, you're a member of the national team, and the coach is, you know, in the, in the early preparation parts of the season, he, he or she is sending you workouts. You're doing them all. And then – and then they bring you into Calgary where our bobsled track is, and you're going to do a month there. That's where you would use a combination method, okay? Mm -hmm. You might do it in rowing. You might do it in ski jumping. You might do it in um, – I, I came up with a couple of summer – well, rowing would be a summer example. So all of these methods, as obscure as they can look, when you – and this is what drove me crazy about the books. He doesn't talk about any of this. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. this is from me having conversations with them and understanding it. And then just over the last 15 years, I've, uh, what is 13 years I've, you know, I, I live this. So I figured it out. Right. And it's like, yeah, well, that's exactly where you would use that. So, so it all depends on, on what, where, what your situation is, what your philosophy is, you know, I mean, they all work. <clears throat> I prefer to use complex, but I might, there's a couple of block ones that the, like the block combination one is really interesting. Um, uh, you know, I might use that. I was thinking the other day, looking at it, go, you know, it might be good for a change up. If you've been doing complex with an athlete for years and their, their, you know, their overall performance is stagnating, do a, do a block for a, for a, you know, however long it's going to probably take you two or three months to do it, mm. do it in the early season, do a block just to, just to, you know, make a change up, stimulate some overall adaptation, long-term adaptation. Right. Mm. And that's the brilliant, uh, the brilliance of it. You go back you look to this now and you, and you, you know, once you understand all this, you look at it, you go, Oh, okay. Well now I have, all, these are all options. These are all tools. And then <clears throat> once you understand how to read the charts and you read, you look at them with the peculiarities overlaid, then you can go to any of his books. You don't even need to look at the text. You just go to his other books and you, you look at, and you look at the charts and you can figure them all out. Just going back to the stage method there. So, cause I know complex, you're doing all four exercise classification at once. Um, with, with one of the stage methods there you spoke of, so you're doing the, the, the GPE and the SPE 
till you reach peak form. And then are you removing those completely and then moving on to SCE and CE? So like if it's you, block, that's what you're doing. If it's staged, the SPE carries over. You maintain your weight room. Let's call it weight room strength. It doesn't necessarily have to yeah, be that, yeah. but um, let's you know you're maintaining those abilities in the yeah. second. By virtue of the fact that you change exor the exercise set, that will maintain that peak condition that you achieved in the in the preparation stage. You will maintain that that. Uh, form that you created throughout the specific preparation stage mm -hmm. so with either complex or variation it doesn't matter yeah so like so again my question will be with with one of those methods then are you just purely living off the residuals of gp and and s and sp whereas the other ones you're, you still have some retention loads when you move into the sd and c yes uh, basically, yeah, you know, I mean, there's a bit of delayed onset there, I guess. Uh, but remember, in a stage, you you are carrying on that SP and you're still developing it. I mean, you're okay. still doing it. Now, the ratio of, you know, will change. It might, you may do less of it, but you're still maintaining it. Um, GPE will drop right off, so you'll lose that. But uh, that may not be important to people. Whereas in a block system, you are completely stopping that and you go on to SDE and CE in the, in the specific preparation block, not stage block. And then that is, um, you know, and then you are relying on that delayed onset. Okay. You know, and, and if you're going to do a block system, you know, you need to, you know, grab a Surin's books and read up on those because he's, to me, he's the master of all of that. His block periodization book is fantastic. Yeah. In fact, I talk a lot of, a lot of, uh, I was just doing one of these modules the other day and I actually threw up some pictures of that book and the, and the modern, uh, uh, building the modern athlete book, because yeah. I, I read those all the time. Those are great books. And you know, this, just cause you're doing bonder Chuck doesn't mean you got to ignore every other every other uh you know method you've ever come across and I, I keep coming back to the course i apologize i'm not really trying to oversell or anything but one of the things i say in the intro is you don't to do bonder check you don't got to give up your favorite schemes mm. you just have to fit them in within the, the bonder truck model which primarily means not wave loading volume and intensity so you can control the athlete's reaction and make it more reliable and repeatable yeah, up there in my bookshelf, I have transfer of training right beside his block periodization. So, uh, yeah, yeah. I, I love uh, block periodization books, even though I, I do have a question, like, about Ishran's, uh, some of Ishran's work. Like, not saying that it's not legitimate or anything like that. Okay, there it is there. I got these two right here. They're just sitting beside me. This is, I'm in my man cave. This is where I listen to my music. I love, and so, I, love uh, you know, I got them sitting right beside my. They're right, they're right covering up my new neil young live album live at the roxy i was just about to say oh, yeah i love the t-shirt there so i do there's my one there you go there you go uh, right yeah yosef johnson would be very there you go yes absolutely there you go I actually i have um i have his other books but they're they're up in other parts of the shelves there the, but yeah ishran's i have block periodization too as well but the one thing about it the one thing i would say about ishran and like say the tables he has in here with regards to you know compatible qualities non-compatible qualities and the residuals is like there doesn't seem to be any other information out there bar his and it's always his own work he references and i've heard like very conflicting things in terms of residuals so like in his book he's like aerobic has a long residual whereas i've heard other people say aerobic doesn't have a long residual and then i've heard other people say well central aerobic has a long residual but peripheral aerobic has a short residual in that like you know cellular adaptations can go quickly but like things like morphology the heart and all don't change too quickly and like, there's all this sort of you know, yeah. Well, you know what? You could say the same thing about Bonnerchuk and his research into transfer of training that, you know, those were all done on athlete questionnaires. Mm. And I've never seen any, you know, anything repeated like that. Um, you know, um, I would say to that, you know, but I, I, I'm a Bonnerchuk guy, right? So, you yeah. know, um, but I love reading a CERN and, you know, it's like, you gotta like, you know, it's like, it's like political discourse, right? You have to be able to look at other views and other, and, you know, and other research and be able, you know, you, you can't shy away from it, right? You have to read it and you take what you need and you leave the rest, right? And, 
it's uh, I I I get what he's saying. You know, Assurance a big believer in this idea that you know, in order to really develop certain abilities, they can't be developed with other abilities, with the development of other abilities. And that's essentially the idea behind block training. Whereas Bonner Trek is, uh, you know, he's this complex guy, at least in his practice, he's a complex guy. He has block. He it's in the book. He, 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 it's there. You can use it if you want. He's, you know, if you're going to do block a la Bonner Trek, it's in the book, do it that way. But he likes to do complex because he doesn't want to – he finds he can get growth when he does them all together, okay? Um, but uh, at least the at least the sports or events that he works with. Um, and he doesn't want to – he doesn't like the timelines around block. It just takes too long to uh, to for an athlete to reach peak condition because you, you're breaking it up into – blocks or if it's stage stages right and so like i just explained if the only the only problem with all that stuff is that well there's two problems one is the timelines it makes it longer to reach peak condition and number two um and this is not something necessarily i've heard bonder chuck talk about but you ask any world-class sprint coach or throws coach or jumps coach or any sport where skill is a huge component well, they're just not going to go through two or three month blocks of the year and not do any skill work or at least or or not do any quality skill work. OK, so it's just they're just, you know, that's just not something that we're prepared to accept. And guys have tried it. And, you know, you go back and it's like, you know, you got to start from scratch, technically not right from scratch, but, you know, we would rather develop those abilities simultaneously we find they enhance each other a bit better um you know that was that's the germans are big on that so it all depends on on you know on what makes sense to you your environment your sport your philosophies on you know just on that so like i think again there's a little bit of misinterpretation and i hear like again it's some conf- con- conflicting i'm just making but with ishran's block model he actually speaks i don't see a big difference between bonner Chuck's complex model complex parallel and ishran's block because ishran has retention loads for other quality so he he doesn't necessarily just do a block and then completely stop doing what he did in another block he even speaks in the book that he retains a lot of those things he just brings their retention loads down to maintenance volumes while he'll emphasize other qualities and I see the same in Bonner Chuck. Like, like Bonner Chuck's not going like 100% in each one of those categories. It's obviously fluctuating depending on yeah. athlete, athlete qualification and stage of preparation. But in the Verkashansky uh, um, conjugate sequence system, when you read that for the first time, that's where there's, there's, uh, and there's cases of exactly. where all, all they do is just like they work on a physical capacity like strength or power or speed, and they don't, they might do any technical work. But then in some of the later Verkashansky stuff, so his book, the Special Strength Training for Coaches Manual, they speak about retention loads in that. So maybe Natalia started to add that in. I don't know. But uh, because, I mean, similar then to Vertical Integration by Charlie Francis, where he's like, we train everything all the time, but we just emphasize something while we retain the other yeah. qualities or other traits or introduce the other qualities or traits, again, depending on that the qualification. Um, yeah, and, and I, I go through that in the course. I, I, I'm, you know, it's like you can, you know, you can do the Bonner Chuck method and you, you know, certain, even though it's, yeah, it's complex or whatever, certain, you can, you can do it in a way like any other, any other form of periodization where you can, you can have emphasis on certain abilities in certain cycles, like in certain development cycles. Okay. Nothing wrong with that. Like, you know, if I'm coaching a hammer thrower, I may have what you would, what you would call an off season development cycle. So these would be a development cycle, a PDSF period of development, a sport form, same thing. It's what we call it in the Bonner truck system. Uh, I may have some of those in the season where I'm really hitting the SPE hard and I've reduced a number of throws. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. Uh, and that's, you know, and when I'm doing that, that's really not that far away from what a CERN's doing. I have to be careful when I'm talking with these things because yeah, I mean, it's so easy to get, 
to speak in black and white terms. And, and in fact, that's the reason why I like Surin's version of the block system better than the Vershansky ones, because it's not all or nothing. It is a little more, yeah. you know, it's, it's not, but, you're not completely excluding this, okay? But even, so, e- even, in, even in super training, though, uh, Vershansky does say you should keep some element of your technical, your technical sport, even during the blocks, even just like to small maintenance. And the main reason for that, now he, again, these weren't the words he used, but the main reason was because of basic skill acquisition. Because skill acquisition for me personally has been a massive area of research just due to my master's. Like I've read six books on it lately. And a huge uh, sort of team from all that literature is this concept of recalibration of the organism in terms of its expression of a sport specific skill. So for instance, if you change like the morphology of the organisms of the body, so you make someone bigger from a hypertrophy standpoint, and then if you make them stronger, so basically, if you increase an organism's biological output, it has to like almost relearn or recalibrate its sport specific skills with its new biological output. So it's constantly having to recalibrate. So to take technique out while the morphology or the neurology of the body is changing is not a good idea because if you go back, it's like having to completely relearn your, your sports skill over again because you're a completely different organism than when you actually originally learned those skills. And as we know from like, the, you know, the, like, the likes of Sean Miska and the, the Keith Davids of the world, we know that like, skill acquisition is so variable and non-linear moment to moment. So it's, it's key to keep it in there. So that's why it yeah, might... Yeah, well, that, yeah and, that, and that's why coaches don't like to do it. You know, coaches in, in highly technical sports don't like to do it. And I mean, yeah, yeah. you know, if you're going in in some, I mean, in some sports, like... Let's say, uh, like in throws, you, you, you could do that, ver- you know, you could do a block system and maintain a bit of throwing if you really dial it down and you mm-hmm. don't do it very often mm-hmm. and it's very low intensity. It's all, you know, it would probably become just in, in its extreme, almost like drill work or something, right? So you're yeah, just doing yeah. that. But um, in sprints, well, if you're not sprinting above a certain intensity you're not sprinting right so and to to marry any kind of high intensity sprint work with super heavy loads in the weight room let's say it's really difficult like you're asking for trouble so that's a very very delicate balance and and you know one thing i remember i use this story all the time is um i remember what you know uh when i was in loughborough overseeing uh, at, at when I was a center director there uh, overseeing a lot all those national coaches we had a number of sprint coaches there that were big time traditionalists right mm-hmm. and so they would uh, you know they would it wasn't block training but it was so stage training that was so far removed from any form of specificity in the early stages that it was I mean we're talking huge waves and then a big rise in intensity. And, man, it was like you Inj- could set in- your calendar by it. Injury people, shit show. Yeah. They'd all walk in injured because as soon as you, you transition from the, from the heavy loads into, you know, and, and you started dropping the volume and rising the intensity, there's that middle zone there where the two cross. Yeah. And, the, you know, the body just can't take it because it hasn't been – you know, for a number of reasons. One is that the load is all of a sudden, the load, not the volume, but the load is all of a sudden markedly higher. It's risen quite sharply. And number two is the athlete hasn't been doing any high intensity sprint. They think they have because they've been running on, you know, sub, sub max speeds, you know, low, lower medium velocity speeds on grass, but that's not it. And so they, when they come up, um, as they come into that and the intensity rise and it tends to rise pretty quick, hmm. then uh, the, the hamstrings can't take it and they get hurt or whatever it is that breaks down. It's usually the hamstrings. Yeah. I mean, I remember sitting there just April, just was like a revolving door in the therapy room with athletes coming in from those programs. It's true. <laughs> it's gas. So, yeah, no, definitely. Uh, no, yeah, you spoke about that when you spoke at Altus back in um, February, 2017, you, you mentioned that was one of the issues with that, like, you know, the old school, type model you know that that just like that all of a sudden that uh that just increase in intensity and, and you were just like you even showed it on a t- table you're like and right here is where injuryville yeah. lives yeah 
I, we, we had one athlete in particular that it would happen to, and I remember sit, I tell, I might've told the story. I remember sitting in my office, my office was right, was part of the therapy room at a glass wall and a door there. And I was in there once, one day sitting with our, uh, our head doctor, our top doctor, Rob Chakraverti, we were sitting there, we're talking and I looked at my watch and I said, Oh, it's uh, April 12th. Uh, so-and-so should be coming in with a pulled hamstring pretty soon. And literally, I swear to God, the next day, Rob is in there working on an athlete, talking to an athlete, and this particular athlete comes walking in limping, and he stops what he's doing, and he looks up, and he looks right through the therapy room, through my glass wall window, and he looks at me, and I'm looking at him, and I'm just, you know, I wasn't grinning because it wasn't funny, but I, we, he was just like. You were, grinning, you were grinning inside, I fucking tell you. Well, I was just like, you know. It's so predictable. Yeah, yeah. But, so, uh, but uh, like, again, just going back to, to these different types of models, so going back again, speaking about Verkajansky and Isher and, and Bonnerchuk, like, the, I, I suppose that for me, when, when I was coaching more, like, the system I mainly used would have been very similar to Charlie Francis' virtual inter- integration because I, I mainly involved in team sports, and I'd be very influenced by Al Vermeil, and Al kind of took his stuff from Charlie and, you know, I would have read a lot of Al stuff that he'd done when he was with the Bulls in terms of, like, you know, applying vertical integration in a team model. But, again, since learning now more about skill acquisition, it just makes sense that Al has this great saying, it just makes sense to have a thread of everything in your program all the time. So, again, having this emphasis, de-emphasis model, so you're always emphasizing something while you're retaining your other qualities. But with the skill acquisition thing, too, another thing, and speaking about recalibration, again, if you if you increase biological output, you've also uh, increased the organisms, what, um, the organisms affordances, what's called your affordances. So for instance, like let's just say a, a crude example, an easy example of this is like um, your vertical jump was t- or 30 inches, or you, you could jump on a 30 inch box with like a 34 inch box, not a hope in hell. But now because through some type of general physical preparation, we've increased the, your lower body power potential. And now a 34 inch box is well within your capability. So now your affordances for lower body um, power expression has increased. So again, if, if your biological output is going up, it just makes sense to keep a thread of technical or tactical abilities throughout your training cycle all the time and then just fluctuate the emphasis given the time of, the time of year it is in, in terms of the preparation stage. You know, and, and, and in fact, a lot of times, you know, we, we, we break these down in conversations. We talk about Bershansky, Asurin, Bonnerchuk, but in reality, a lot of times you'll Pete, find if, if you were to look at what they're doing. Don't forget Peter Cheney. Peter Cheney, right. You know, they're not that far off. They're all basically doing the same thing. Yeah. Anybody, anybody who's competent working with any of those methods, you go out and watch their workouts at any point in the year. And you're going to see a little bit of this and a little bit of that. And, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's, it, it's rare these days that I come across somebody that's, that's uh, executing a true stage methodology where you're going, you know, other than those, some of those British sprint coaches where you're going from, you know, big, big volume and low, low intensity, you know, everyone's somewhere in the middle there. Right. As yeah, opposed yeah. to, you know, that's opposite of the Cheney model where, or the Bonnerchuk model where, you know, it's the, the load is high all the time, right? You know, everybody's, I think most coaches I come across, especially, you know, the, 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 the higher end ones, they're all, they're all somewhere in the top third, I would say in that, you know, like they're, they're away from that older methodology, but they're all, you know, they, they, there's some elements of stage or, Mm. or there's some emphasis on, on some qualities at certain points of the year as opposed to others, but they're generally doing, they're pretty specific all year round, you know. I think that the main underlying principle that, that, that can potentially connect all these different methods and models together is that is a term called the consolidation of stress is essentially what we're trying to do with all those models. We're trying to consolidate stress in that, like we can't just keep adding and adding and adding because again, we only have such a finite cup of adaptive capacity. So like, you know, if you're doing an emphasis, uh, an emphasis retention model, you're emphasizing particular quality while retaining others, people like that. Cause again, you're retaining other qualities, you know, so they're not detraining, they're just maintaining while you can maintain another one. Whereas, you know, the real old, like the real old school, what is the, the, the actual mindset of block is that you're living off residuals off, of uh, previously trained abilities 
um, and that you've peaked them all together in, in one go. But again, some people then are, are fearful that, you know, what's the point that, you know, that you're losing too much of the previous uh, qualities? Why not have some type of retention load there? Um, which I'm more of a fan of as well. But I think overall, anyway, it's all about just consolidation of stressors and that if you're going to add something, you have to take something or reduce something away at the same time. Yeah, 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 yeah for sure. I mean, I mean, you know, it's interesting uh, going back and having to go through this bonder truck stuff in prep for this course and looking at it from, you know, um, other perspectives you know Bonnerchuk's perspective as opposed to what I've been doing the last 10 years is taking his and and experimenting and making it my own and that kind of thing and there was a, a long period I didn't really I haven't really asked Dr. B questions for a long time because like you get to a point with this system where it's all about experimentation and I don't want I just didn't want to cloud my mind with you know so with with you know any input from him that you know I want to learn it figure it out on my own right yeah. Well, one of the things that that is interesting now that I'm going back to it is this idea of going of rest cycles in between the PDSFs or the development cycles, which Bondarchuk almost never does. He only does the rest cycles at the end of the season after the last one after the major comp. You, you call them washout cycles, do you? I call them washout cycles. That's my term. Um, Mike Tashir calls so, them pivot cycles. What's that? Tashir, he calls them pivot cycles. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It, to sure. Well, I was gonna. I was just gonna mention him. So, so him and I had a great talk the other day. He he's really done a good job with this man. He's, do you, do you know how he came across your work? You. Yeah. Your your podcast. Yeah. Uh, the podcast we yeah, do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, him and I have talked quite a bit, and and uh, um, <clears throat> I actually got to contact him this week. But he he's brilliant. He's done a. Uh, it's brilliant. shocking. I mean, I, I get a lot of people talking. Uh, one of the reasons why I'm doing the course got to get so many people asking me questions about it. And I just was like, you know, I, I need to organize this and might as well make some money off of it. <laughs> but he's one of those guys. But with him, it was like early on, I remember we were talking. I said, well, you know, send me your, uh, just send me a couple of graphs of your athletes reactions. And when he sent them, I was like, wow. I was like, okay, just by looking at the reactions, I, I, I could tell this guy gets us. Like, wow. Well, he, okay. he, tra he tracks. He lo he's tracking. Yeah, I mean, he, he, he's, he's, well, you can tell by the curves yeah. how clean they are and how accurate they are that, you know, whether someone's doing it right, right? And so it's pretty interesting. But anyways, back to this thing about, you know, rest cycles. It's like, um, I, you know, my experience with using rest cycles is a lot different than Dr. B's. Mm. And the one of the I I basically got about eighty or ninety percent of the content done, and I've been leaving the content on rest cycles to the end because that one is going to require some um, disagreement. Well, it's just different perspectives on it. Not so much disagree, just different findings, right? And I think coaches need to um, ex are going to need to self experiment a little bit with, uh, with rest cycles when they implement the bonder truck things. It's, yeah. I've just never been able to make it work right. Doing one PDSF into another without some kind of rest cycle and bonder truck is, is pretty adamant that you need at least four to six weeks rest. And I'm like, no, I, I, I can do it with down to 10 to 12 days rest. And I get good lines after he and he's, you know, and he we, we don't argue about it. He's just more interested, right? And mm. it's like, you know, the, but the way he says it is there's a change in how an athlete reacts if you if your rest cycle's not long enough. I found that, I have evidence of that, but I also have evidence that they will, you know, repeat their previous reaction and grow as well so it's really interesting um at the end of the day it doesn't matter right yeah, because yeah. as long as you're getting growth it's just i i you know and i went back and i had a big conversation with him a, two weeks ago about it in his office and i said you know well then why the hell would i do a rest cycle if i can do two pdsfs and he goes well you just might want to yeah. <laughs> I, I, in one of the videos you it, just might do it why not right so yeah and i'm like oh okay well i want to do it so 
in one of the videos you sent on to me, you mentioned Nick Garcia, and I, I think you were mentioning you've spoken to him about these rest cycles. And there is a difference between doing a passive and active rest cycle too. I think you mentioned in one of your videos. You know, I think if you do active, you can shorten it down versus you were saying Doctor. That's B. my belief. Yeah. That's not Bonnerchuk's belief. Okay. 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 That's, that's, that's not. That's not accurate with Bon. And if I said that, I was wrong. But that's my belief. No, it's probably me right. misinterpreting. Anyway, he's not going to watch. No, this. no, no. I I may have said it because I yeah. I that's what I thought. That's been my, that has been my experience. Okay. But it's not, I went, I was very clear about that when I asked him, he said, no, either one doesn't matter. So. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. One, definitely one thing I want to get in here then is the three different types of responses or what you call the peculiarities of developing sports form. Mm -hmm. Um. so there's three different responders that we get and, um, Another thing I will ask once you've answered this then is, do you see certain personality traits with, with each one of these types? Because just Christian Thibodeau has come out with his neurotyping. Now, I know people watching and listening, there will be those really evidence-based people God, or the, the evidence and the science behind that is absolutely toxic. But uh, Christian likes to like like type his athletes by like their neurotransmitter dominance. And just like the type tree sounded really like your type tree. His type tree is like a person who does not like variation, who likes regimented same in, same out. And it's just like, you were like type trees don't do well if you put too much variation into our program. But tell us about the three types of responders on in the bonnet truck method. Well, that's really interesting. I have not thought about it. I have not noticed it, but I haven't looked for it. Okay. Mm. So in terms of a personality trait coinciding with these, with these different reactions, I would have to go, plow through years and years of charts and think about the athletes to, to see and that. you so and knowing that. you you will <laughs> yeah i might that's it that's quite interesting <clears throat> okay here here it is real real basic okay so there's three reactions the first one which we call athlete number one is when an athlete starts at the lowest level of form which means they're coming into it at about 90 85 to 90 percent of previous form how are you measure? How are you measuring that? By the way, I was wondering watching. I was like, I don't, I don't. That's just the thing. I, that's that's the thing. I don't measure it. Bonner Trek doesn't measure it. It's just assumed. Okay. Yeah. You could measure it, but we just never have. Okay? Like it's just. Like, I was just like, what is ninety percent of your sports form? I mean, particularly if you're talking like about like soccer or rugby. It's like, how can you? Measure oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, in those sports, it would be almost. I mean, you know, that's a whole other section of the courses, and I'm. You know, uh, Matt Jordan's going to hopefully do a course uh, with on, on specifically on doing measurables for the Bonner truck course as a companion course to this. Um, that's a whole other thing is, you know. Hi, in, hi, hi Matt. Yeah, yeah, good guy. And uh, he, um, anyway, so, you know, measurables uh, in team sport is really difficult, but you can do it. It, it yeah. can be done. I go through all of that in the course. I, I don't want to get into that now because that's a rabbit hole. We could talk for hours on that. Um, but essentially, they're, you know, using your measurables, however that is, in throwing, we have it really easy. And that's probably one of the reasons why this system developed from Bonnerchuk, who was a throws coach, because we can throw every day, even twice a day, and measure in the heavy throws, not so much in the javelin, but in the heavy throws. So um, – we measure every day, we record it. When you do that, and over time, and you don't wave load, volume, and intensity, when you don't change things, and that's the key, and that's the thing nobody will accept, or, or you know, everybody sort of seems to overlook that point. It's very important you don't do that. Then athletes will follow one of three responses the first one is they start off at a low at the lowest level 85 to 90 percent and they just basically go straight up to a peak condition so the results just get better and better there's fluctuations it's up and down but mm -hmm. generally speaking if you were going to just do it on graphically it's a straight line up you know whatever that's number one. Number two is an athlete that starts at about 92 to 95% peak of previous form. Okay. And those athletes go down first. They go down um, for a bit and it's individual how long they go down, how long they stay down, and then they come back up. So it's just like number one, except you have a, a, a part on the beginning of it where they go down before they come back up. Okay, that's number two. Number threes start at 85%. And Dr. B says sometimes, uh, sorry, 95%, 95, 96, he says, you know, somewhere in there. And they go, they maintain 
their form for a bit, then they go down, then they come back up, okay? So those are the three reactions. Now, the only difference between the three in terms of individual peculiar, like, oh, sorry, the, in terms of individuals is that whether you have an athlete number one or a number two, it doesn't matter which type of, whether you use a complex or whether you use a variation method, right? So in other words, whether you keep the exercises the same throughout a cycle, truly complex, or say Bondarchuk complex, or whether you change it every two to four weeks, which is Bondarchuk variation, they're going to show the same result. The only difference is with a, when you change things, it's going to take them longer to reach peak condition, okay? Mm -hmm. Those two, whether they're one or two, is irrelevant to what you're doing because, really, because it's not going to change your methods. But number threes are different. Number threes don't react well to change. So with a number three, if you do a variation program, i.e., if you're changing things, then that athlete will just flatline. They won't improve. They won't go down. They won't go. They just, you know. And in fact, that's sort of the method we use to maintain form once an athlete has achieved form, which is actually the, the module I was just doing this morning before we started this. So, you know, uh, so within the bonder truck context of that or the context of the bonder truck system you know that's pretty important because if you have a number three you don't want to use a variation right but outside of the bonder truck system and again this is where i think people that would take the course would be you'd be this is what blew me away more than anything when i started studying bonder truck is this idea of how powerful change is and basically what that's saying is that there is a certain type of athlete out there that does not react well to change. Well, think about the athletes that you've worked with in the past. I've had athletes in the past that didn't, never grew. No matter what I did is they, they, they just, you know, athletes that didn't improve or didn't improve much, nowhere near like other athletes. I mean, I've yeah. had athletes that had massive growth with this system. Some of them don't work. Well, when I look back on it, I think, oh shit, I, you know, I was changing things. And here's the thing. When you have an athlete that doesn't respond to training, what's your first reaction? To change it. To change it, yeah. right? So all you're doing, if you buy into this idea that Bondarchuk proposes that there is this athlete, the more you change it, the more they're just going to stabilize. The more, the more they're just going to maintain whatever form they're at. That's like, <clears throat> that's huge. And I think, and, I, you know, I say this a lot. It's like, even if you're not doing the Bondarchuk system, that's a pretty important piece of evidence that I've never heard anybody talk about. Maybe there are other people out there talking about it. I've never seen it presented where someone has said, look, you know, variation will cause a certain kind of athlete to flatline. Mm. That's huge. And, you know, I just – that along with some of these other – you know, I, I guess the biggest message – that I, that I have with that is that, you know, you, I've learned through the Bonner check system, how important it is to regulate change. Change isn't bad. Change is good, but you have to, you've got to control your loading. Yeah. And, and in order to establish what an athlete's normal natural reaction is going to be to loading before you can start making all kinds of changes. Because I just think we have so many coaches out there, and I was one of them, that have all this change going on day to day, week to week, cycle to cycle. And yeah, there's some athletes react well off that, but two implications of that. One is some athletes aren't gonna to respond to it. And number two, the more change you have, the longer it takes an athlete to reach peak condition. Those are two big, big, things that you can learn from Bond or Chuck. And, you know, when you go through, particularly when you go through studying his stuff, particularly looking at methods and then looking at peculiarities, it all just jumps right out at you. It just, just, it's right there. And you, and you're like, wow, like, okay, if this is all true, 
well, this has would have, I don't see how it could not have implications on how, on program design for coaches in virtually any sport. So going to the personality traits, just off the top of your head, have you, have you ever noticed that with a type one, two or three? No, I've never, never noticed it, but I've never looked for it. So yeah. I don't, I don't know. Um, off the top of my head. Uh, now listen, if let, let's no. uh, get, get, get back to me on that one. Cause I have a few other questions I want to ask before we wrap up. Um, so I've heard you speak about this concept too, that Bonner Chuck, then again, I just, I only briefly remember this. Did Dr. B say that, you know, about every like three to four years, it's almost, you should like completely start clean with an athlete in terms of changing to a different sort of methodology within his system. It's like a, it's like a, a, a macro uh, washout. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. Well, so he says every five years. So, okay. but you know, I mean, he just, it's just, I think he's just throwing that timeline out there randomly, but um yeah, he's, you know, I mean, this is just, it's the same thing. Just on a bigger on, scale. On a bigger scale, right? So the whole, the whole, the one of the other key ideas of the Bonner truck system is he doesn't use the wave loading of volume and intensity to stimulate adaptation, okay? So he's not changing loads and intensities all the time in order to get an athlete to increase. He keeps that dead constant. Yeah. He stimulates adaptation by changing exercise sets, okay? So in other words, the programs, the content, the actual content that you're giving the athlete in terms of, um, uh, you know, the exercises you choose, and to some degree, the, the, the loading, like the loading will change from one cycle to another, just not within a cycle, right? But we use, we use the exercise change to stimulate adaptation okay so from one pdsf or development cycle to another and that's a quick pdsf is a collection of microcycles so it typically six weeks to three months long let's say okay so it's equivalent to the old macro or meso cycle depending on what your definition of that because that's another term that gets yeah yeah switched around um, so, you know, we change from cycle to cycle and that's what stimulates adaptation. Well, you take that idea on a grander scale and you need to change your overall method from, you know, every five years. And I've been playing a lot. I've been talking to Nick Garcia a bit about this, uh, you know, just in looking at, you know, a lot of athletes in our sport that will make a change in coaching or make a change in programming, you know, and usually they don't make changes in programming, they make changes in coaching and the, the different coach has a different method, a different program, right? Different environment. Mm. And you see, it's quite typical in our sport where an athlete will change coaches and right off the bat have, you know, year one is a great year. They, they usually do quite well. Not everybody, but it's, it's very often and maybe year two is pretty good but by year three it's dropping okay mm -hmm. and you know we could make all kinds of judgments about that in terms of the the quality of the of the coach's programming or ability to coach but I think in a lot of cases um that is uh it's it's more a reflection of the change in methodology and the athlete is just adapt quickly to the coach's methodology. So they either need to change the methodology or change. And if that means change coach and change coach. And, you know, like we just recently, there's a girl in the U S a, a hammer thrower named Deanna price, just smashed American record through 77 meters. She's had the same coach for a number of years now. And she has just done this grown very progressively, um, very steadily with this guy. His name's John Smith. I've never met him. I've never talked to him. But to me, when I see when I saw that, it was just the other day on the in the weekend. I was like, wow, you know, that's a good that's sign of a good program. Mm. Um, it's a sign of a good, well structured program that he's getting growth in year three, year four. You know, I mean, that's that's not easy to do, and it you know it uh, you know he's a guy. Maybe you don't. Know, people should be taking a look at what he's doing but um and from what i hear he's a big 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 strength guy big weight room guy but again you know you can't always believe what everybody says i'm sure what he does is 
is uh, you know very similar to what to what we do. You know, probably is on the upper end of the force velocity curve, not totally maximal, but a lot of you know strength, speed, and stuff in the throws. I'm talking about you know, mm. but anyways, he has that reputation as that, and you know, but this guy is oh, and it's, she's not his only athlete. I mean, he's got he's pumping them out left, right, and center. This guy and all world class. So you know, when I see that when I see that kind of improvement over the long term and it's steady growth like that, that tells me the guy's doing something right. Somebody's doing something right. There's a, there's in terms of their, their system may not be the bottom truck system. It may not be assured, but it's a system that somebody has developed that is effective because when it's not effective, you'll get one or two years or, Either it's not effective, the system's not effective, you get one or two years, or the athlete just adapts really fast to the system. And that's possible too. It could be a really good system, but the athlete, you know, is just one of those that adapts really, really quickly. I was an athlete like that. When I was an athlete, I would get into shape so fast. It was ridiculous. Like I would be in peak condition in, you know, af after six weeks of general training, I would be ready to go like it's just my body responds to training super quickly i'm not i'm not i wasn't a good athlete i was national level decathlete and at the bottom end of that national level but in terms of how i would react to, i could notice changes in my body so fast and i would my improvements would come so quickly right and that's that's a good thing but it's also a it's a double-edged sword because athletes that are like that you have to you have to change things faster because they adapt so fast and they will do it on in on a on a micro scale in a short term scale like in a bonder chuck pdsf and they'll do it on the grander scale mm. and so a lot of it's unfortunate sometimes i see when an athlete has a couple good years and they drop off and you know it's just natural unfortunately that we blame the athlete right all oh, the athlete you know, the athlete wasn't motivated, lost their motivation or isn't listening or whatever. And a lot of times it's just, you know, you need a methodology. To, they just need a change. Okay. Not necessarily coaching change, but, you know, a met, a, they, they got to change shit up. So finishing up with a few more questions, trend trends, Derek. So I know a huge thing within the Bonder Chalk uh, method is trends as in seeing a trend within your athletes so i know you spoke about with sophie hitchcock when you trained her i think it was between 33 and 36 was it 33 and 36 sessions or something yeah like that? about that year that olympic year was 34 to 36 and there's a video there you sent on and it was nick garcia's thrower in high school and he was like between 14 and 16 but even within like that trend you were even and i thought this was very interesting you were like see session nine he always took a dip and then there was always an up and you were like so the, the one thing with the spawner truck system is you seem to need to get – so there needs to be patience on the coach's part because you seem to need to be able to get a bit of data on each athlete to start to see their trend lines. And you – but it's important to point out that, that those are done without wave loading volume and intensity, yeah. right? So you're talking about the video I gave to you, a preview of the course, mm. the, the video that I gave you. You're talking about that one, right? Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. So nobody's seen that, and they won't see it in – until they take it's in the section on um it's in the overview and don't ask me for because i had to sign a contract where derek said if i release it he'll kill me yeah i know you know you're not giving it to anybody uh <laughs> I, i'm gonna post some preview starting next week i'm gonna post a few things on youtube sections of the course for people mm -hmm. so just get a feel for what it's like maybe i'll maybe i'll make that one of them that's a pretty cool little section though that mm -hmm. that's an amazing example that nick does a great job with this I don't like to say nice things about Nick. Uh, I don't actually like him, but, uh, but he's doing a very good job with this. Um, so when you don't do that, again, yeah, you will, you, again, we go back to these reactions and you will get a, you'll get fairly, you'll start to see trends with athletes, even with different programs, different sets of exercises as long as the loading isn't super out of whack either way heavy or light you will start to you'll see trends like they will come into peak condition 
relatively speaking, within a few sessions of from one PDSF to another. So let's say in one PDSF or development cycle, the first one you did with them, they came uh, into peak form after 50, let's say, let's say 30 sessions. Let's say you had three programs, three different workouts, and they peaked after 10 exposures to each, and you're running them all at the same time, one after another, okay? They peak in 30 total sessions. Then you take your, a rest break, short rest, and then you, you do another PDSF with an entirely new, different set of exercises. There, we found, and this is one of the things of the whole Bonner Truck system, that athlete will peak again around those sessions. And if, in that example that you're talking about with Nick's, it was in the first PDSF, it was 14 sessions. In the second one, it was 16. And in the third one, it was 14 again. Well, that's pretty powerful. If you can tell an athlete's going to peak within two sessions, that sets up meets really well because all you got to do is make sure your competition is your 14th or 15th session, right? But, and this is more to your question, what you also notice in there is that on certain days, in certain points in that progression, not it's not 100% all the time, but it's you saw how regular it was with Nick's guy, is they will have up days. They will have little, remember, it, the, remember I said the line is not straight. It's up and down, up and down, up and down, right? It's, you know, mm -hmm. looks like a, looks like a heart, you know, whatever. It looks like a, looks yeah, like yeah, a yeah. stock graph. It looks like a stock graph. It's up and down, up and down, but the general trend will be up. Well, you'll notice that on certain days, they will have better days than others. Like regularly, uh, like in, in the example you're talking about with Nick's guy, Every sixth session, the guy was up. He wasn't in peak condition, but he was up relative to the, where he was in that point in the curve. And every ninth session, he was consistently down. Mm. Okay? So, why is that important? Well, think about that. If you are not wave loading volume and intensity, you can take that information and you can use it when you have to, when you do things like, like maintenance cycles. So, rather than have an athlete change their maintenance cycle, which has to be very regular, rather than having it do every two weeks, which is the general advice, the example that Bondarchuk uses in his literature, I'll change it on, if I, was, if I was Nick coaching that athlete, I would change the maintenance on every seventh session. So every seventh session would begin would be a new set of exercises to maintain form because why not have the guy start it after he's he's on and up right as opposed to a down, so, um, you know and I'm sure sports oh here's a here's another one where that would be really important suppose a guy like you is working with a a, a soccer uh, sorry football. Uh, athlete and let's say the guy uh, the the athlete is set, is burgeoning professional okay and you're training them in this pdsf and it's leading into camp situation and the, and in the camp situation there are certain days they're going to be on the field that they they are going to be in front of the coaches that are going to select them for to give them a job okay yeah. right well, you better bloody well make sure that if you're in a development cycle and you're training through that period leading to a peak, which might be an actual formal test, I'm going to want my athlete on that field on day six, yeah. not day nine, yeah. okay? Because on day nine, he's, gonna, he's regularly feeling like shit. I'm going to want him on day six when he's on and up, right? That's the kind of that's the kind that's the way you would use that kind of information right like it's just it's just you know it's it's not a hundred percent but it's it you'd be surprised at how regular it is and and it can become really powerful stuff how i'm just right what came into my head there sure is how could you even implement that with a team then because i mean what if everyone's like mini peaks within so if you took like the in season of Can't. Yeah, so if you do the in season, like well, you know, and, and some guys peaking on day six, and some guys peaking on day twelve, and some guys dipping on day eleven, and some guys dipping on day sixteen, and but the match is all on the same day or whatever. Right. Well, but but okay, there's a couple ways to look at it. For, first of all, when I in the course, I mean, I'm really targeting. I don't say it specifically, but really for for 
for sports like that, team sports, field sports, things like, you know, um, I am really targeting guys like you that are working with in, individual athletes or certain developing individual programs for athletes and that it's yeah. not necessarily, I don't know if you could actually take the bonder Chuck method and implement it for a team uh, yeah. in a team. Now you can use the concepts. Absolutely. Right. Watch change, man. Be careful with change because everyone's going to start reacting when you when you start changing things frequently. Maybe for the good, maybe for the worse. And you know, so that's really important, okay? Um, but yeah, I mean, it's uh, you know, that's 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 sort of who I'm, I'm targeting to. The other thing is that, yeah, you may have athletes. They may be down. Maybe it's not an up day. But if it's in the latter half of their curve, they're still yeah. going to be up relative to where they started. I mean, true, you know, true. they're still, it's not, you know, I'm just, and it's not like, you know, they're going to be so down. They're, 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 oh my God, they just lost this opportunity. No, it's just that if you can time it up, mm. do it because they're going to feel a little bit better and it might make the difference on, you know, that, that kind of thing. So I know like, like when Dylan Armstrong was on the European circuit throwing and he really dialed this in well in 2011 when he, when he won the Diamond League was, uh, you know, Bonnerchuk would send him to Europe and rather than have him maintain uh, a peak condition, he would, you know, because he had big meets coming up, he would be in Europe on the circuit making money throwing but he would be in his PDSF. He would be in at the lower early stages of developing form when he wasn't in peak condition. And Bonner Chuck would absolutely do that. Have him try, try to time up his sessions by playing around with the density so that, so that he landed, he competed on those mm -hmm. days when he was naturally up. I think Dylan said he had three, points within his p within his curve i'm i'm going off memory here but it was he had a number of points it was two or three points in his curve his reaction where he was consistently on an up day and they always try to compete on those days yeah yeah i remember you said that's a really interesting point about the density schemes i remember we said that when we previously spoke that that in the bonnet system like if you only had a certain amount of days to a competition and you did want to get some mini peak, you would actually be more in favor of getting the amount of sessions in within that time frame, even if you had to do more. More than you normally would. Yeah. Within that time frame. Yeah. yeah. So, you try, yeah. so you, you, you're essentially your training density would, would go up because you're trying to fit in those sessions. That was interesting. Yeah. Have you, have you noticed any like longer term trends in terms of, let's say like, you might see an athlete does really well complex wise. And then for whatever reason, you, you, they, they seem to, when, when they get diminished returns on that, then you've seen that if you switch to stage variation, it seems to continue them on an upward growth again. Have you seen any sort of trends in that way in terms of change of the methodology over the course of a, a career? I've never done it. I've always stuck with complex. Um, I, I've only used variation and it's not really a variation method, but I've only changed things on a regular basis in a maintenance phase. Um, excuse me. So I can't, but I would assume that they probably do. And I would assume that, um, you know, that's why at that point you would need to change, you know, um, mm -hmm. there are other ways to create adaptation, to stimulate adaptation other than just the exercise sets. That's one of them. Change yeah. your method. You can also change your, your microstructure. You can change your workout structure, a real common one with bonder truck. It's kind of, you know, a, a well-known one is going into a parts program where you're breaking everything up and you're doing like specific work mixed with uh, weight room work in a workout like that, you know, um, that's a good way. I'm doing that with an athlete mm. right now mm. um, to see how he reacts. Uh, you know, there's, you have a lot of tools for change yeah. and you need to, you need to tap into whichever ones you can. So uh, one, one big one that really worked well the last year I coached Sultana for cell was, um, it's just, I'm just doing maintenance cycles this morning. I was talking about this, but one thing I did is we went, she finished a PDSF. It was quite a strong PDSF. This was in April, May ish of uh, 2015, I guess. 
2015. And uh, I put her into a maintenance cycle, but I, I did something I'd never done before. I'd used a terrace method. And this is getting kind of complicated when we're talking about the bon the Bonnetrek methods. You know, the 16 methods we, we talked about earlier? Mm. Stage, well, Terrace is a different one. It's in one of his books. Um, and I just sort of took that idea and implemented it within a maintenance cycle and boom, she went right through the roof. And she had these massive PVs uh, in, in, in her training distances uh, and then went into a meet in, went to China for, or no, went to Japan for a meet, had the best meet of her career in terms of right across the board results. And then came home and some weird shit happened. And, she, you know, we, she, we, we, we both made a few bad mistakes, you know, of traveling too much and she just, her peak plummeted and she yeah, never recovered yeah. from it. So, but, uh, but up to that point, that change, you know, with me putting in that terrace method um, really got a good bounce off of it. So it was, you know, it's, that's an example, you know, she was ready for some kind of change, you know, it's all, it's about using change to stimulate adaptation, but controlling it at the same time, you know, and to do that, you have to experiment with the athlete and you have to collect data and you have to watch for trends and, and, um, you know, it's, uh, it's, you know, it's the bottom truck system is not for the lazy. Okay. You have to be prepared to collect stuff. You got to be present. You got to be, you got to be, uh, you know, I'm coaching a couple, uh, I'm coaching a javelin thrower right now, long distance. And, um, he is, uh, you know, I've never even met the guy. So it requires a lot of communication for us to go back and forth. And we had a very successful initial PDS PDSF and now he's crashed a bit. So we're trying to bring him back up again, but I just don't have a lot of experience and I'm not there on the track every day with him. So it's, I'm trying to manage that right now with them, but he's, he's doing well now. He's back, he's coming back up and, and um, you know, so, but that, you know, to do it not present is tough. Like it's, mm. it's, I got to reach down in my bag of tricks quite a pretty deep to, uh, to make, to make this happen, but so far so good. So real brief Chinese water torture. Just give us a quick yep. little, uh, a quick little, um, discussion on that so you know the the a b programs a b c programs is there even an a b c d when someone gets good advice? you can have five ten programs if you want again it's just the more programs you have the longer it's going to take the athlete to reach peak condition mm. cool. the more programs the more content you have in the program the more you break it up in terms of stage block combination or complex and the more change those three things all lead to a longer peak, mm, mm. longer time to peak. Okay. Uh, oh, what one, was your question? Oh, sorry. On that, you know, well, you know, you, well, you answered my question there, and, and, and like I'm, I'm, I'm well aware of like the, you know, the so the the drip drop drip. Um, I, I, I really think for for viewers or listeners who are not familiar with that, just get get their course because sure. it'll make it'll make, sure. it'll make way more sense in terms of like having sure. an A B program, A B C program. One thing I sure. definitely want you to touch on, because you, you mentioned this at Altus, and it was, it was kind of a topic I really wanted to talk to you more about at some stage. Um, I would have talked to it uh, at dinner when we were at James Gerald's, but uh, Buddy Morris had you well cornered that night. For yeah, that. Buddy and I were in it. We were talking about gummy bears. <laughs> it was gas. But you mentioned a really interesting... I got to um, go to Phoenix and, ha and, and, and have some gummy bears with uh, Buddy. Buddy Morris, yeah, he's the man, all right. Well, he's I, I, I don't do that anymore, but um he uh yeah he he uh, and I, I remember remember who i i, I remember when, when the two years were sitting there i was like look what i've created because i entered because it was <laughs> i went to go visit him and i said we were talking about bonner chuck and i was like do you have you ever seen Derek? you know Derek Evely? and he was like who's Derek Evely? i was like you know Derek Evely? it's like he's coming to all this and you guys gotta meet so that's how that all happened but um my brother from another mother man yeah. i mean that guy and i it's a good thing we don't live in the same town especially back in my younger days him and i would have uh we would have torn it up oh my god i, I just i i just i immediately sons, got along with that guy sons of anarchy I he's being in prison now so what if you grew up together but yeah. uh he's, uh, he's a great yeah. bloke buddy but you spoke about this concept of the difference between transfer and specificity and you and you know because everyone's like oh it has to be specific the transfer and you're like 
you were like saying not necessarily so it was kind of topic or rabbit hole you said you were kind of going down at that time when you were also looking at this concept of specificity um and transfer saying that you know sometimes you don't what you're doing doesn't necessarily have to be 100 percent specific to actually transfer to performance so like did you look more into that rabbit hole or I think thought a lot about it, um, especially doing the transfer module for this. Um, yeah. So, you know, like generally speaking, and, th and this is where like black and white thinking will get you killed in methodology. Okay. Like it, it's so it, it, easy to latch on to ideas or read things and think, in such black and white terms that you kind of miss the point sometimes. Okay. And yeah. one of those, a good example of that is bonder trucks transfer training books, which are really good. I, I, I actually really like them. They're, they're, I think they're of the best translated, you, you know, yes, is translated them and you can actually read them. Um, uh, they're pretty good, uh, not without their flaws, but, but worth having for sure. Right. Mm. But you, but when it, if nothing else, the charts. Okay. So you look at these charts and you, and he, you know, he's pretty specific. I and mean, Dr. B did all of these, this research and all of that research came from questionnaires where he questioned athletes at all these various levels. Yeah, exactly. And he's, you know, so an athlete at this level, if you use a squad, it, it only has this transference, this number, anything over, I think it's 375, 0.375 has transfer below that it has no transfer negative anyways well those are you know to me those are guidelines okay you know the 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 real message there should be don't use uh these exercises or don't use maximal strength or don't use you know whatever um the message should be you know generally speaking the more specific the activity the more it's going to transfer but you also have this thing, and this is big in Bonderchuk system. One of the, again, one of the things I've learned is that you can have the most specific exercises with the most transferability. Let you know, let's say we can measure it on a day-to-day -day basis, and it's going to stop transferring if you use it all the time. Mm. Okay, like your body is just going to adapt to it. And it's not going to give you the bang that you got when you originally used it. You could say the same thing for if you're a uh, if you're a javelin thrower. You could say the same thing for heavy javelins, light javelins. You can go right down the list in terms of specificity. Uh, throwing balls. You could go down to med ball work. You can go down to weight room work. You can go down to a bloody push up, okay, or a sit up, and say you know say that for all of these things it, it's only going to give you whatever transfer you get or it's only going to work for you for so long right so that confuses things okay and so you have to understand that that you're, you're always searching for for exercises that transfer and when you have evidence that you have exercises that do transfer you can't go and use them all the time you have to rotate them in and out periodically Otherwise, the athlete fully adapts, okay? So, you know, I have had situations where I have, you know, because the Bonderchuk system controls things so much in that PDSF, it makes it much easier to establish transfer correlations. Correlations, not cause and effect, but correlations. Mm. Makes it much easier to establish those because – we tend to use fewer exercises, but hit them harder, and we don't change things in the middle, you know, in the middle of a cycle, okay? Yeah, yeah. So when you don't do that, you can take your data that you're getting, and you can make, it's easier to make inferences in terms of what is transferring and what isn't, mm. okay? But even still with the Bonnerchuk system, it's not easy. So, but I have just had situations where, you know, the, you know, I've made changes to an SPE um, or a, a loading scheme in an SPE. And I swear to God that that had a fairly significant transfer in that cycle. Okay. So I just don't think that you can, I just, I think there's a danger in looking in looking at something like those charts and looking at, looking at it as 
you know, a page from the Bible and saying that, look, okay, you know, uh, because I've seen evidence in Bonder Chuck's work with some of his athletes where, in my opinion, they probably could have used a bit more maximal strength, right? Mm -hmm. They probably lost those abilities down too far and, and paid the price for that. So, and that's just my opinion. Okay. I, mm. You know, I mean, he's had great success with the throwers here, but I have seen evidence of that. I may be wrong. It might be something else, but sitting from the outside looking in. So I'm just, you know, to me, I just don't think, I, I just think that these black and white perspectives and statements just don't work. Yeah. And you have to be able to experiment and find out for yourself with the individual athletes you have what works for them. Some things are going to work for others. I remember, again, Sultana putting in some heavy squat squats once, and I, I needed a change-up. And we had exhausted our change-ups in, in, in um, weights of hammers and special exercises, or at least I, I just I wanted a change-up in the SPE. And I said, well, what haven't you done for a long time? She goes, well, I haven't done any deep squatting. I haven't done it in like 10 years. I haven't done it since I started with Bondarchuk. We've never done any deep squatting. So, okay, fuck it. We're, we're, we're deep squatting. So we went, you know, deep squat with the, we used the bar velocity to, to uh, we used a push band to determine the loads. It was relative, pretty heavy, uh, but not, you know, I would say we were probably in the 90, 88 to 90% set of one rm range i didn't measure the one rm but i'm guessing mm. fair load for a woman she was she was over 300 she was pushing 300 pounds deep right to the floor you know we we progressed up to it because she hadn't done it in a while and uh bam that pdsf phew, right through the roof yeah yeah it's the only thing it's the only I mean, I change everything in that PDSF. It was all new exercise, but it's the only exercise in that PDSF that she hadn't done in years, right? Like, and sometimes that's all you need. We also see evidence of this in, you know, when we look at transference of exercise across populations in terms of, you know, going from development to elite, okay? Mm -hmm. So, we, we know for a fact, I mean, uh, you know, that developmental athletes, almost anything transfers. Mm -hmm. If your five-year-old kid getting out of bed and, you know, running across his room transfers to more strength. I mean, that's how you develop when you're five years old, right? Mm -hmm. So when you're in your teens, you know, especially if you're raw, then, uh, you know, un untrained or, you know, unexpected inexperienced in sport or training then just about anything you give those athletes is going to lead to growth you know and and in a lot of cases even if they don't train and they just do whatever whatever the different sports are they're just competing in sports in school that will lead to growth okay mm -hmm. so we know that at you know down there there's great transfer the 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 margins of error are just are you know, really big, right? Like you can give them as long as, you know, that's not what defines competent development programs. What defines competent development programs is yes, is the athlete growing, but are they healthy? And are you preparing them for what's coming down the road? That's different than an elite athlete, an athlete at the other end who is super, super highly trained and has exploited every ability and every facet of every ability to the max well that's that is a lot harder trying to trying to create transference because your your range of exercises or your range of avail, avail, available methods especially in terms of exercise and intensities is extremely small mm -hmm. because because you've gone from this concept as a developmental athlete where it's multi-dimensional to this idea of singularly directional loads, which an athlete at the later end of their career, everything you do, everything, as other than some GPE you might do for recovery, everything you do is directed to be better in that pattern. And when you're talking about uh, you know, a pole vaulter, or a shot putter that is in one of these, like I described before, one of these things where that's the only thing they do, man, you're talking about everything is zeroing in on one activity. Mm. So to find 
um, <clears throat> to find methods and exercises, things that transfer is extremely difficult. So you got to start look. You got to start getting creative and looking out, outside of the box, but also respecting the fact that specificity you know you have to have a high level of specificity pretty much all the time so that's kind of you know uh, when you're talking about transfer it really depends on the context of what you're talking about not only where is the athlete on the developmental spectrum is a developmental or, or elite but where are they in their own program and what have they what have they not done or what have they done in terms of yeah. movement experience and loading over the last few years? If this, these are all things that factor into transference. Yeah. Big time. Big time. Yeah, and, and Bondertrick talks about that in the book, but when you look at the charts, you know, you, you got to like, you have to take that into account. Yeah, so it's, just, just that idea of black and white thinking. Anyways, that's enough. It's, of it's a, no, it's, it's brilliant. And it's, oh. it's, kind of timely that you uh, speak on long-term athletic development because again it's an area that i've been looking into an awful lot and and james fitzgerald the founder of opex and uh, me and him have had a lot of conversations around it because one of the one of the big areas that james constantly talks about is this concept of maximum physical potential and how how just a human can reach their maximum physical potential and he talks about you know this the the, the flawed concepts within some athlete development models and it's actually it's not even athlete development models it's just that some flawed um methods that athletes get exposed to in their career so essentially what he talks about is that athletes get exposed to uh, intensity type methods way too soon in their career like he said they, they need more accumulation more volume more movement more diversity more multilateral development to help support then a, a higher ability to reach a higher level of, of maximum physical potential and just I know Boris Shako, the I've said this to James, Boris Shako, the powerlifting coach, he kind of has this like model where it's like at first it's all about skill, mode control, you know, volume, getting lots of repetitions in at the at the powerlifts. And then the sort of second stage of development is just like quantitative overload. Just get as strong as you can in the lifts. And then he's like, when that when when specific training volume and when quantitative overload have reached their their peak in terms of we're just getting a purely diminishing return. He, he, he then goes to his kind of third stage development where variation is what he uses now to continue to, to continue uh, to help the athlete to get continual growth and it's nearly like a dynamic systems theory thing where he uses task environment and organism and he tries to like change up the task so that's where he'll put like minute changes in the exercises and the whole idea is now the overload to the system isn't quantitative overload it's more perceptual cognitive it's more about trying to solve problems and that's how he's overloading like the brain and the nervous system now because quantitative overload just won't work anymore it's it's the, it's brought the athlete so far and now it's, now it's variation so basically so the three phases are like motor control skill acquisition putting in your volume accumulation hypertrophy work capacity work we're talking about powerlifter then it's quantitative just get as strong as fucking possible in in the specific sports specific exercise which in a powerlifter is squat bench deadlift and then when that doesn't go any further he's like now we have to do variation and that's kind of goes in like the whole Franz bosch type world well, variation now to try and drive the organism to higher levels of, of potential exactly so he knows he's on top of it right he yeah. gets it right like i mean you know and after variation he'll probably come up with something else maybe you know after you know seriously Drug, why not to drugs yeah well you know so you know he, he think think about it this way think about all of these methods these micro methods in strength and conditioning that have come down the pipe pick one there's millions of them right like um, you know, I've, I've been, I haven't studied a lot of that stuff recently, but I'm sure, you know, some moment will come up with some kind of method of cycling load or something like that, or presenting exercises or something, and then they'll, they'll brand it and they'll present it and they'll try to sell it, or maybe they don't sell it or whatever it is. Right. And these, we have seen these things come along, you know, they come along constantly. Okay. And then you, you know, the, but what I look at is, is I kind of step back and I, and I look and I go, well, you know, all these guys eventually move on to something else, like, and something, or someone will implement one of these strategies and it'll be like, oh my God, I got such incredible results, boom, 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 boom. And the, you know, the athlete takes off and then you don't hear from them again, right? Mm -hmm. Or they, you know, or they, it petered out and then they moved on to the next method or, you know, so so what are you saying? Like, what are we saying there? Are, were none of them legitimate? I mean, because none of them last forever. None of them, 
I've never seen one that where an athlete was using one of those things right throughout their entire career. Yeah. No, as long as they're rational, they're all legitimate. But the problem is, is a lot of times we, we can't see the forest for the trees. So we see that, you know, there's the, the you have the, um, you know, you have this period where this thing works really well and then the a athlete adapts to it, adapts to the, the method and then you got to move on to something else, right? And, you know, so again, it, you know, it's, it's, it's about the change up is almost more important than the, almost more important than the specific content itself. It's yeah. the fact that you're changing because that body, it's like the body wants stability. It wants that period where you're, you're, you're hitting it, you're hitting it, you're hitting it, you're dripping on it, you're drip, drip, drip. But then, and this is how I came up with the, 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 the analogy of the Chinese water torture. Chinese water torture feels pretty goddamn good at the beginning, right? Oh, yeah, oh, I like that. You know, <laughs> and after a while, ah, you're going nuts, right? That's when it's time to, well, before that, that's when it's time to change. And this, and this is what it, it, it is. It's, and this is the brilliance of Bondarchuk, what I think he's so brilliant, is that he recognized this and recognized that it's, it's, you need to control that change. And it, it's, the, it's almost like the change is more important than the actual content. And mm -hmm. when I'm changing programs, when it comes to, to some degree SPE, but for sure GPE, that's absolutely my attitude. I don't give a shit what it is, as long as it's a change. I just need to, I just need to change a GPE. I just come up with, and that's, in volume, that's the most we do in terms of yeah. repetition. We do more GPE than we do anything, just by nature of it, right? Yeah. But I just, I don't care what the exercises are, relatively speaking. I just want a different set. Whereas you go up that exercise classification, when you get up to CE and SDE, I agonize over the choice of my next, my next set of, of exercises because those are super important. Mm. That makes it's, sense. You know, yeah. So. Oh, it, it, listen, that's exactly where my headspace has been in, in terms of thinking about training methodology for a long time because it's, it's a huge paradox, not even in training, but in life. So within training, there's this paradox of specificity versus variation. And then within life, right, if, in, in a lot of like uh, human behavior psychology, uh, psychology books, they talk, about, they talk about the two biggest stressors to a human is uncertainty, but then too much certainty. Yeah. Yeah, so it's, exactly. It's 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 like you see this it everywhere about. in life. You see it everywhere in life. You know, people love change, right? My favorite Neil Young quote was uh, one of my favorite Neil Young quotes is I was reading an article once, and um, it was an article on him, and the writer said, uh, "I know the, the 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 writer of the article was interviewing him and said, what advice would you give to a young and up and coming?'" Uh, songwriter who has plateaued in his career and he said two words he said change things that's it mm -hmm. that's all he said and it you know and again this is may seem like a ridiculous analogy and I know I'm a music guy and you and I talk music and but if you follow Neil Young's career which is I mean of those aging rock stars I mean he's still that guy's been relevant his entire career he just has these wild swings in his I mean every album is different right and and you, you, you can never expect the same thing from, and that's how he stays fresh. Mm. That's how he stays real. Bob Dylan's a bit like that too. Right. Mm. And, uh, you know, it's, I think it's a, it's a, uh, it's a, uh, what do you, what do you call it? It's a, it's a basic truth about life. You know, we, we like stability, but then we need change. Yeah, exactly. You know? And we're not all, you know, some of us like it change more sooner and more often than others, but, you know, we're all a little bit different, but generally speaking, change is usually a good thing. All right, wrapping up here, just quick fire ones, and then we, we got to go. You must be busting the go to the toilet. You're drinking water there. And sitting no, there. I'm all right. I'm sitting. <laughs> you, you, have, you have hours, man. What was that? Good. It's good. We're at two hours now. Yeah. Oh, yeah, there. yeah. Um, you have a built-in toilet in that chair, have you? You just. I wish. I, I've actually gone to the toilet twice since we began, would you believe? Um, I was going to ask, so I'm going to ask your, your top lessons. I'm going to ask you for what you're reading right now, book wise, uh, some resources, life advice. And then I'm going to ask you two big questions at the end. They're, they're quick fire though. 
Wow, she, okay. She All right, so what are the biggest lessons you've learned? Now, life and career-wise, anything, you know, so it could be just one major thing that you learned or anything or something you changed your mind on, whatever you feel is coming to your mind there now. Wow, man. I mean, you're talking to a guy who's made, who's come a long way in terms of changes in his life. Um, be honest and be objective. And that's, that's you know, I think uh, advice that I would, I would give to any, any young coach and, any, and anybody in life, okay? The ability to be objective and to be able to not let your mind, get, especially in this day and age, get clouded with, you know, some of this crazy ideology that's out there. Uh, to be the ability to be able to stand back and look at things objectively and seek the truth is critical. And I have made that a priority in terms of raising my kids now because of all this bullshit that's going on online. And, uh, you know, I mean, it's just, it's ridiculous how this is ramped up in the, in the, in the past few years, not just Trump and all that, but all, you know, every, the, the massive online presence that's out there, um, you know, it's just, there's, it's so easy to bullshit people and people get so easily bullshitted that for me, th that ability, you know, I'm trying to teach it in my kids to be able to determine what is real and what isn't, what is true and what is not. And I think that, you know, uh, one of the, I, I seem to have this, be able to do that pretty well. I think naturally it's one of my skills, one of my gifts, I guess. Um, and I just always shake my head when I see people who just get so blindsided or so clouded in their judgment because they just they they ignore facts can't see facts and you know um i'm uh, pretty opinionated but i like to see facts as well there short answer good good no, great answer it's definitely something we'll talk about more because i have a huge follow-up question that but we we're short in time but it's something we'll talk about but you know and i i i agree with the sentiment in terms of all try to be as objective as possible but my next question would be how because because it, 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 like if we actually aren't quantifying or measuring something and we're just saying we're being objective through our object, through our subjective experience, well, then it's not objective. You know what I'm saying? Cause everyone and everything is the way they are for a reason. So you, you might step back and say like, and say you're being objective and, and saying, God, those people are making bad decisions, but you're basing your decisions off every experience you've had up until your moment in life. So like, you know, you've been greatly shaped by all your experiences in the environment. So you can't really say that that what you're thinking and saying and feeling right now is objective because it's, it's fair really enough, but fair enough, but I can expose myself to as many different viewpoints as possible and yeah. I can question everything. And I yeah. think if you do that, then you will, you will, you know, you can, you can get as objective as, 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 yeah, as, as close as, as, as you possible. can. Yeah. Cause we, we, we all have as dancers. better than buying into it's better than yeah. blind faith in every, every, Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. I, I guess. I, I guess a good way of putting it is to be more of a critical thinker. Because no matter what, we're always going to have a bias or or some um, uh, bias or some. What's the other word I was going to say? But bias is one thing. But we're we're always going to have some bias or subconscious belief. And and the reason we have sorry, we're all going to have some bias because even if we think that we're trying to be as objective as possible there's probably some type of subconscious belief system that we're not even aware of, hence why it's called subconscious belief. Yeah. Is, well, critical is, thinking is really, that's a nice way to package yeah, all that. Is, well, I'm just saying a subconscious belief thing, it can filter how we're perceiving reality in that moment of time. And if it's subconscious, yeah. we're unaware of it. But I remember asking Paul Check one time what, like what he thought like the term of being a spiritual person was. And he, he to him, I think it's a great uh, definition. He's like, being a spiritual person is being nothing more than being responsible for what you bring into creation moment to moment. And he also speaks about this concept of the awareness of being aware. So like your awareness of being aware is how you can be more conscious and objective. Wow. Person. I did two internships with him when I was a young coach back and those were probably the last two they were each week long. Wow. And, um, I did, and they were probably the last year that he did them and they were phenomenal, had a yeah. huge impact on me as a coach. I think he's great. Everyone thinks he's fucking crazy. I love the crazy shit, though. So that's the stuff I yeah. love going now. All right. So that's uh, it. Where you leave and leave the rest. Take what you like and leave the rest. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so that was the biggest lessons you learned. Great. Fantastic. And really, that's kind of life advice you gave there. In terms of resources, so your website, we're definitely going to plug it and plug the course. But 
What about other resources? I did a pretty good job of it myself. Here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What about other resources? And it could be any resource. It could be even like music as you, as you get into like, what about like albums, books, websites, people? Like, is there any resource, like something that maybe changed or inspired you throughout your life? Any top resources you'd like to give out? I, uh, you know, I'm all over the place uh, in terms of methodology and stuff like that. Like the specifics of what we we're, we're, what we were discussing, I keep, I keep a pretty narrow scope these days. I like to, you know, I was reading some of a certain stuff, Bonnetrick stuff and whatever. Um, I've got a pretty good groove going with this method. So I, I'm really experimenting within that. Um, in terms of reading, I read a lot of biographies, you know, mostly. Um, one book I read recently, and this is, I don't know. I mean, this is really all about more about kids is, was iGen. Have you heard of this book? I'm not I, but I, I, I read a lot. I read a lot on child development, so like I love it. So, do you have kids? You don't have kids, do you? No, no, don't have kids. Never had a. If you got kids? You got to read this book. It's called iGen by Jean Twinge, and it's a. She's a basically a. Um, <clears throat> well, it applies to to adults as well, but it's really about um, the current generation or the last generation that just sort of ended. Um, kids that grew up, the first generation that grew up only knowing uh, screens and the iPhone. Yeah, yeah. And she's a, uh, uh, she's a generational anthropologist, I think is what she, what she is. And basically her job, uh, she's been studying the differences in generations um, for the last 30 or 40 years. And when she started studying, that's her job. That's what she does as a researcher. And when she started studying this current generation, she found all these spikes that she'd never seen before in all these different me mental health parameters and um, issues. And, uh, you know, she's basically tied it into this, uh, you know, just the, the presence of phones and social media and how, you know how you know some of it's good but a lot of it's bad and uh you know the impact that that's having on kids so that's had a that reading that had a pretty profound effect on me um you know and i'm a dad with kids that are at that age right they're 9 10 11 now so are about to be 10 11 12 so wow. um but uh you know i read oh god i read i read a little bit every day not you know i don't read as much as i used to i'm trying to but what's but your favorite some, biography The, oh, of late, uh, I read the Greg Allman biography, which is really good. Um, they're mostly music biographies that, that, mm. that I, I don't know, I got a stack of them right there. I can't, uh, God. Gordon Lightfoot's right there. Uh, I started his not long ago. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I just, I go from one. I don't know if I have any one particular that's huge, but the Pete Townsend one was really good. The Bruce Springsteen one was really good. That was a really good one. Cool. So um and what what are you reading right now uh, so actually before you ask that what what is the one book so the tim ferris question what is the one book you would give to everyone if you could give it and what are you reading right now well everybody watching this podcast i always go back to uh zatchiorsky's science and practice of strength training the green I think one that that, you, you love the green one yeah the green one yeah yeah i I think I, I don't even know if I have the, the, the second edition. I have me, the it's second just a, it, he did such a good job with that. And it's, it's such a good basic. I wouldn't say basic. It's a, it's a phenomenal book, but it's such a good concise synopsis on strength training and a lot of ideas around methodology in that. It's always been my go-to. I just love that book. There's a couple other ones. Um, yeah, I can't come up with them right now, but you know, I mean, I've read a little bit of everything. I, you know, there's very, I, you know, uh, there are very few of these texts that I've ever read from from front to back, but that one is one. So that at, least, at least you off. know the title of it. The amount of people that don't know that fucking title, they're like, yeah, the practice and science. It's like the science yeah. practice and training, Why is that? and they don't even know his name. It's like, oh, boy, your man, uh, Zika. Well, I, I butchered it for years too, right? Yeah, yeah, I know it's weird, but yeah. Uh, all right, last two. For whatever reason, you've got 365 days left on the planet. How are you spending them? Oh, wait. Wait a minute. No, I totally forgot. I'm reading Steven Pinker's book right now, All right. which is phenomenal. I'm about a third of the way through. How, how did I not? It's not here. It's up in my... It's, What's it it's called? Enlightenment Now. Ah, okay. And See, now, I, I, I have to put all these books in the show notes, so I need to know them all. 
phenomenal book phenomenal book could be the best read ever for me wow. you know uh yeah so I, I i won't get into it but if you're you know it's pretty interesting it's basically the premise of the book is that looking back on the enlightenment and saying you know on these enlightenment ideals and looking at the world today and you know maybe things aren't so, as bad as we think you know we're actually doing all right uh, listen, uh, as, as i said to you when we hopped online uh, like when we were online but we were off recording like i was like listen we're, we live in a first world country man we've got nothing to be complaining about yeah like come yeah, on we're on, we're on a fucking laptop here having an interview like how hard is our lives you know what i mean yeah absolutely uh, you've got one year left to live how would you spend that year i would follow my uh kids around uh probably if i only had one kid my oldest kid is a drummer and he's a burgeoning little rock star and so i would follow him around in his band and just become a and you know pick up whatever groupies i could get my hands on okay the last question the very last one you'll love this one and i have I'm i have sure a, i should have said that oh well I have, I have a feeling that uh, i have well i have a feeling like i think i might know one or two people you might invite to this but so i'm uh we're back in arizona we'll say and myself and yourself meet up and uh we go for dinner and i say to you here derry have special powers and you're like what are you talking about i was like i can bring people back from the dead and you're like okay and like but listen hear me out hear me out you can bring five people to dinner tonight we're gonna go to dinner you can bring five people they can be dead or alive who are you gonna bring to that dinner and why number one would be charles darwin uh, i've always loved uh you know i've always i wouldn't say I love his yeah i guess i love his work but i i have a huge amount of respect for him hmm. um einstein for sure uh so probably so many people say einstein yeah for sure why not right i mean you know i would probably if not einstein probably some astrophysicist uh you know maybe Great. carl sagan that would be good you know um What's that? Two or three? That's that's uh, three. Me on the spot here. Who? Uh, what's that? That's, that's three. three. Okay. Yeah. So Genghis Khan. I think he would liven things up. We would need some kind of, uh, you know, uh, and Dwayne Allman. Who? Dwayne. Fuck. Jesus Christ. Dwayne Allman. Go Greg on. Allman's brother from the Allman Brothers. I am a massive Allman Brothers fan. I'm probably as much in the Allman Brothers as I am into Neil Young. And he died after their second album. And he was probably the greatest living slide guitarist at the time. And uh, he's a uh, legend. Let's in check him out. I thought, you, I thought Neil would be on the list. I thought he's Neil, not dead. Oh, no. They can be dead or alive. Oh. Oh. Okay, well, I'll stick with that list. It's a pretty good list. That is a pretty good list. So... Go try again. So we get uh, pretty hairy in that, you know. It, it, it would be pretty good. So we had Charles Darwin, we had Einstein, we had Carl Sagan, we had who was number four there? Who do we have? Uh, Genghis Khan. Genghis Khan. And Dwayne Allman. I might substitute Einstein with a female. Who is the female? Janis Joplin. Ah, oh, very nice. Marilyn Monroe, maybe Marilyn Monroe. Oh, no, she she'll, she'll get drunk and she'll fucking have a big. She was, so will Janis Joplin. Yeah, Janis Joplin would be way more fun, I think. Anyways, okay. <laughs> so the guys, she'll get Marilyn Monroe. Like some of the, the, the some of the guys will ignore, her and then she'll have a big fit, like and unless substitute, substitute someone out and bring JFK and see how that would go. That'd be that'd be kind of funny. Yeah, it, this is what went on. All right, Derek, listen, man, that was epic. Over well over two hours now, and uh, I knew this is this is Sorry why. About. I, yeah, this is just a great conversation. So for all the uh, listeners and the viewers, thanks so much. Uh, I say most people listen to this because, you know, I don't, I don't think many people sit down and actually watch these, you know, maybe most people listen to them. But we are on YouTube. We are on iTunes. Make sure you subscribe to the OPEX podcast. So sure. Derek, thanks so much. Uh, do you want to just plug the website where you're on website and when, when are you hoping to launch this course? I'm hoping... Uh, it my date, my target date is July 1st. Um, and uh, tentatively the, it's not up yet, so don't go to it, but the website will be www.eviltracksport.com, but it's not live yet. So you, I know you um, yeah, so I bought that domain, <laughs> just did it yesterday, but anyways, uh, 
yeah, that'll be the uh, that'll be it. And hopefully by July first, it'll be up and going, and uh, you'll be able to go and take a look at it and see what's there. There'll be an introduction that'll be free. It'll outline what is on what is involved in the course. And Sweet. It's mostly video content. So, and it's, you know, I don't, I don't even know if I'm going to have tests or anything like that. It's really just about getting the information and helping coaches to understand the system and get better. So, so it's brilliant. great yeah, stuff. Derek, be what it is. Derek, thanks so much. I'm definitely going to be back on because there's a few more concepts I'd love to discuss with you. But for now, I think uh, we've, we've, uh, we've put in a good shift, as they say. So for all the listeners and viewers, from me, Robbie Burke, from Derek Evely, see you all soon and talk to you all soon as well if you're just listening to this. Peace. Thanks, Robbie.